and welcome to this podcast about phishing messages. What I'm going to do in this session is have a look at a particular phishing message and the signs that may enable a recipient to determine whether it's legitimate or something that they should regard as bogus and therefore ignore. Now in order to help us do this assessment, I've got a checklist here of four considerations that we might want to keep in mind to help us consider whether or not something's likely to be genuine or a potential scam. And the four factors are the legitimacy of the request, the importance of the information that you're being asked for, the apparent source of the message, and the timing pressure that's involved. Now we won't go into detail about each of these at this point. What we'll do is have a look at a phishing message and go through the process of analysing it and then reflect on how these criteria can help us spot it as a scam. So let's move on then to look at the phishing message itself. Now this is an example of a real message that was genuinely received within a target organisation. So let's start to have a look at some of the characteristics that reveal it as something we should be wary of. So first of all then, if we look at just the message title, there's an immediate observation you can make that it looks a little bit unusual because it's got a colon at the end of it. And although you wouldn't say, oh my god, this must be a scam, the very fact that it's not the way you would normally punctuate at the end of a sentence does just begin to start making things seem a little unusual. So maybe your suspicion level should go up a notch there. The next observation you might make is around what the message is claiming to be about in the first place. So, for staff who've received a mailbox warning before, the first clue, possibly, is this doesn't look remotely like what they've seen in that context. If we move on and think about the source of the message, or at least who it appears to be from, we've got two bits of information we can use here. We can have a look at the sender address of the email, and we can look at the way in which the message has been signed. So firstly then, anyone actually looking at the name that this message appeared to come from, so let's say for the sake of argument that it was John Smith, would have found that actually yes, there is somebody called John Smith within the organisation, but they're not linked at all to the IT function, and they're certainly not the system administrator. So if the alarm bells weren't properly ringing by this point, one thing that the recipient could do is actually to contact John Smith and find out if he did indeed send this message. Now, of course, one possible downside here is that if the sender address has been spoofed, then poor old John Smith ends up with quite a number of people potentially contacting him, asking if he was genuinely the source of this message. So what would need to happen then would be that John Smith would contact IT and then get them to send out a message to all users who'd potentially been affected, alerting them to the fact of this scam. So let's look at the system administrator bit at the bottom of the message. This is the claimed signatory, but wouldn't it be normal for somebody to have a name... Even the most hardened IT nerd has a real name somewhere, and so you'd expect them to use it when signing off their message. And in terms of checking it out and verifying the request, even without a name at the bottom of the message, does that job title exist in the organisation? Now in this particular case, there's actually nobody with that as their named role. So by this point, with all the little bits that we're spotting, I'd say that this is beginning to look fairly suspicious. Nonetheless, let's carry on and explore a bit further and do what ultimately this message really wants us to do and click that link. Now in normal circumstances you really wouldn't be advised to do this but you're doubtless curious to see what's sitting behind it so let's go and have a look. Okay, so it's taken us somewhere and one thing I can tell you looking at the address in the address bar is that it bears absolutely no resemblance to the address of the organisation that this message was targeting. Now it's worth noting that we could have actually checked this before following the link. So on a desktop system, if you were to hover the mouse pointer over the link, you'll ultimately get a tooltip that appears that tells you where the link is actually going to. Meanwhile, on a touchscreen device, such as an iPhone or an iPad, pressing and holding the link will reveal details of where it's going and give you a choice as to whether or not to follow it. So by using either of these methods in this particular case, it would have been visible in advance that the address that it was going to wasn't anything to do with the organisation that the message was trying to masquerade as being from. Which again, we ought to regard as more than mildly suspicious. So if we look at this page then, one immediate observation we can make is that there's nothing to identify the organisation that it's meant to belong to. Now, in actual fact, even if it was dressed up with logos and such like, this couldn't really be taken to mean anything. It doesn't convey any greater level of legitimacy to see the logos there because they can quite easily be grabbed and the page faked up accordingly. But the fact that there's nothing here at all is in itself a further indication of suspicion because you would normally expect a legitimate site to tell you something about itself. And let's look at the things that are being asked for. So on the page, we can see that what it's really interested in gathering is the personal information about the user. So the first four fields, the email address, the username and password, and a password confirmation in the way that you're normally used to seeing it on genuine sites. 
That's the information that the scammer in this particular case is trying to collect. And if we then look at the spam protection bit at the bottom of the page, well, that's really just a bit of window dressing to give you a false sense of security. And meanwhile, of course, what it's giving the scammer is a confirmation that this data has actually been entered by a human being rather than some internet bot trying to access the website without human intervention. So, of course, if somebody has got this far and they've entered genuine data into the page and click submit, then they've effectively passed their sensitive information onto a scammer who can then exploit it later. So this is the fundamental reason why we need to be careful of these sort of scams, because if we fall for them, we're passing on our access credentials or perhaps other sensitive information that somebody may be fishing for and essentially handing it over to them. So let's see then how that particular scam matched up against the checklist of things that we should be thinking about. So first then in terms of legitimacy, did the request seem legitimate and usual? Well not really. We do get warnings sometimes about our mailbox size limit being reached but that doesn't normally require us to click to verify any particular information. Should you be asked for the information and is this how you should normally provide it? Well fundamentally no. Within any well managed system you're not expected to be providing your username and password information in this manner. In terms of importance, what's the value of the information you're being asked to provide or the task you're being asked to perform and how might it be misused? Well, quite significant in both cases. So you're basically being asked for your access credentials to the organization's system and there are many ways in which, of course, that information could be misused. So somebody could take over your account, they could masquerade as you, for example, then sending out more of these messages in your name using your account. In terms of the source, can you be confident that the source of the request is genuine? Is there a way to check? In this particular case, it was possible to check the source of the request. It appeared to be coming from somebody internal to the organization. Were they the right person to have been sending the message? No, it wouldn't seem so from looking them up in the staff list and seeing their actual role within the organization. And is there a way to check beyond that? Well, yes, it would be possible to make contact with them and find out if they genuinely and intentionally sent this message. In terms of timing, do you have to respond now? Well, if you think about it, in this particular case, the email was still working, so what it was claiming to warn you about clearly hadn't kicked in at that point, so there clearly was some time to make further checks around the issue rather than immediately having to follow the instruction that it was trying to give. And that's a very important thing in the general context of these things. Do pause for thought, do gather the information, take in the signs, and make sure you're absolutely confident before doing anything of this nature. And generally, in terms of phishing, messages, things that have the characteristic of asking you to validate information and asking you to click a link in a message in order to do so ought to be viewed as suspicious from the outset. Within an organization, with other account providers such as for online banking and web services that you use, it's extremely unlikely that a legitimate provider would try to contact you and get you to do something in this way. And indeed, if you read the guidance for many of these sites, they will explicitly say that's not the way they would do things. So if you're interested in more information about phishing and the wider threat of social engineering, of which phishing is an example, then there's a white paper that we co-authored back in October of 2008. And although that might initially seem a little bit dated at this stage, the very fact that uh, phishing messages of this nature are still doing the rounds and still managing to snare victims means that actually it's still very relevant advice and findings. And it was authored by Maria and I from Plymouth University and also Lieutenant Colonel, well Colonel now actually, Ron Dodge from the United States Military Academy. And you can find it there at that URL from INISA, which is the European Network and Information Security Agency. So, thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope it's helped to raise some awareness around the sort of things to look for. And as one final bit of advice, it's always wise to make use of any technology safeguards that are available to you. So the web browsers that you find on desktops and laptops will very often have phishing safeguards that you can enable within them that will warn you when you're visiting a suspicious site. And meanwhile, it's also very useful to ensure that you're running up-to-date internet security and antivirus software. One of the reasons being that if you do find yourself inadvertently clicking a link and visiting an unknown site, then one of the other things that it could be doing other than phishing is potentially hosting malware. And sometimes just by visiting the site, you could be inviting that onto your system. Finally, though, there's one really important thing to bear in mind. If you follow the good practice and if you're using some of the baseline safeguards, browsing and using email can still be perfectly safe things to do. So don't let the existence of the threats be an obstacle to using the system for what you actually want to be doing.